Last week was one of those rare weeks where suddenly everyone was paying attention to the goings on in Ottawa. And from a showbiz perspective, the House of Commons had it all. Scandal, betrayal, intrigue. The only thing missing was gratuitous nudity. And I was really thinking, you know what? The Prime Minister, the government, the MPs, they must be stoked because they know that for the first time in a long time, people are paying attention. They are going to bring their A-game. No such luck. It's like they all got together and decided to intentionally ensure nobody would ever watch ever again. It's called question period. MPs get to stand up and ask the government questions and they're supposed to get answers. It's there because a long time ago we decided it's an improvement over sword fights and dueling. But it is broken. It needs to be fixed. How about from now on? If someone asks the Prime Minister a question like, I don't know, say, Prime Minister, when you said that nobody in your office was aware of the secret payment to the senator, were you telling the truth, yes or no? He's got to answer the question. If he doesn't answer or he stands up and starts talking about trade deals, a giant red X appears on the screen and a buzzer goes off. I know it's not very elegant, but it's better than the system we have now. Now, when the Prime Minister avoids a question, his caucus, they leap to their feet and start cheering like little girls at a Justin Bieber mall appearance. Normally, I bemoan the fact that young people don't pay attention to politics. But you know what? Maybe it's a good thing because really, parliamentarians, you are a bad example to youth. If it's not acceptable at the dinner table, why is it acceptable at the House of Commons? I don't care what party is in power or who the Prime Minister is, but when you have a leader of a party that refuses to provide a straight answer to a straight question about something that happened on their watch, then it's time for that party to find a leader who will. I love it when it starts like that. You know, wasn't it uh, Terry Molesky who said there's a reason they don't call it answer period? <laughs> I always have questions when I, you know, finish these guys talking. It's just kind of nuts. Well, Harper's really good at not answering questions anyway. <laughs> the question that you need answered right now is who are these guys? I'm Darren Howard. And I'm Robert Nisbet. You're on video radio right now while we take a look at 2013 and the gathering debacle that is the Conservative Party and their amazing way that they're flushing our futures away. That's right. So let's Here's take a quick a look. rundown of the tumultuous year <laughs> that was Canadian politics. The Senate expense scandal dominated Canadian politics throughout the year. It all started in January when Senator Pamela Wallen's questionable travel expenses were sent for an outside audit. A similar audits followed on the living expenses of Senators Patrick Brazo, Mike Duffy, and Mac Harb. All three claimed thousands of dollars in housing allowance they weren't entitled to. But the conclusions of the four audits were damning, leading to Harb's retirement and the suspensions of the three others. On the House of Commons side, opposition leader Thomas Mulcair led the charge trying to get answers, grilling the Prime Minister on what he knew about the cover-up. Outside Parliament, another political problem for the Prime Minister. First Nations leaders demanded face-to-face -face meetings with the Prime Minister and the Governor-General. Divisions among Aboriginal groups became clear as some leaders accepted to meet with Harper and Johnston separately. Chief Theresa Spence was the symbol of the Idle No More movement. She did not meet with the Prime Minister and continued her protest on Victoria Island for several more days. Are you still at finance, sir? Hoping to change the channel, the Prime Minister changed his cabinet on a sweltering July day, but it did little to take the heat off his government. In August, the RCMP pinned the robocall scandal on former Tory staffer Michael Sona, and the next month, the man who handled that file in question period, Dean Del Mastro, faced charges for violating the Elections Act. Documents released by American whistleblower Edward Snowden showed that Canada let the United States conduct a spy operation during the G20 summit in Toronto. And there was outrage when it was revealed that Canada's spy agency conducted espionage on Brazil's mining and energy ministry looking for economic intelligence. Mike LeCouture, Global News, Ottawa. So, no mention of Rob Ford in that clip. What? No mention of Rob Ford. I mean, it's sort of like Canadian politics with some reality behind it. That's right. Uh -huh. Yes, indeed. We are not going to focus on the largest crack victim to ever surface in Toronto history. We're talking about things like robocalls, you know, 
uh, waterways getting ripped up, torn away. You know, these conservatives are totally out of control. They are, you know, they're just destroying our environment in pursuit of economic gain. So what did you want to do? Did you well, want to do... Well, we should talk about how, how the feds are seizing whatever they want to. So when they're coming in and seizing farms, well, look, you be the judge. Check this out. The mayor's family settled this land long before Confederation. They were there before CN built the tracks through it, connecting eastern Canada to the west. It's located in Trenton, Ontario, directly behind Canada's busiest Air Force base. Frank Myers has worked the farm since he could walk. His neighbor, the Department of National Defense, wants to expand. They come to ask me if I'd sell. I said, no, I'm not interested in selling. Not interested in selling. So they just up and said they put the laws and put expropriation laws, but stole it. The Prime Minister promised to beef up Canada's defence strategy during the last election campaign. A new training facility in Trenton is part of that plan, promising jobs and increased national security. So they offered mayors fair market value. He refused the money, but D&D didn't take no for an answer, swiftly expropriating his last 200 acres, despite the deed from King George III designating the land to the mayor's heirs forever. Perpetual. The deed says perpetual. Legally, the government can take any land it deems is in the public's best interest. Only the court or the federal minister of public works can overturn the decision. And construction is starting on the back acres. So Frank's farm, rooted in Canadian history, may be destined to fall. Jennifer Tryon, Global News, Trenton, Ontario. You see, the small guy is the last person that the Conservatives ever worry about. Basically, uh, what was it, Minister Moore, who said that it's not our responsibility to feed children? Yeah, because they're not concerned with poverty. Yeah, they're not concerned about poverty at all. They state it blatantly now. He actually had to apologize, but spent the entire day denying it and spinning That's it, right. okay? This is the, way, the type of government that spends $79 billion on weapons and complains about $14 billion for health care. Is that fascism? Holy smokes. And of course, they're always quick to point the finger at other countries showing how much better we are than them. A case in point, how they're slamming Iran on their human rights record while completely ignoring how they treat our native peoples. Check this out. The UN General Assembly has approved a resolution on the status of human rights in Iran. The measure, which criticizes alleged human rights violations in the country, was sponsored by Canada. The resolution was approved by uh, a vote of 86 to 36 after gaining a similar vote count in the Assembly's third committee in November. Joshua Blake, and he says Ottawa is also trying to deflect attention away from its own human rights record. Well, unfortunately for the people of Iran, they have to put up with this kind of nonsense of Canada's foreign minister going to the United Nations and making uh, unfounded claims against the Iranian government with the twofold uh, intention of pleasing uh, the Zionist puppet masters in this country and concurrently deflecting attention from Canada's egregious human rights violations. This comes just months after Human Rights Watch published a damning report containing allegations made by Aboriginal women that the Canadian police had been taking them to basements and raping them, sodomizing them, those Aboriginal females alleged. That Human Rights Watch report documented 194 instances of the Canadian police using firearms on Aboriginal youth and one instance of the police allowing a dog to ravage an Aboriginal child. Iran had previously slammed a move calling it politically motivated. Tehran had accused Canada of uh, turning bilateral disputes into claims against Iran. It says Canada violates the rights of its indigenous people and minorities. Ottawa's mistreatment of its First Nation people or aboriginals has drawn condemnation from international bodies such as the UN in recent years. And you know, you know we're looking so good with John Barrett and Stephen Harper. Yeah, it's like, it's like uh, Larry and Curly in charge of the country. <laughs> <laughs> what could possibly go wrong? As we do the great intellectual face palm that is analyzing Canadian politics, we do take a look at the fact that right now the Conservatives have succeeded in muzzling scientists, muzzling unions, muzzling workers. They're making, muzzling their own MPs. Muzzling the military so that the military cannot talk about what's going on. Social media is being monitored 24-7. Looks like fascism to me. I, oh. 
Really? Was that out loud? That would be the technical definition of fascism, though. At any rate, let's take a look at who they're muzzling next. While the exact number is not known, at least 1,500 Canadian soldiers were wounded in the Afghan war alone, many of whom come back to tell their stories or seek help. But a Canadian newspaper has discovered soldiers are now being required to sign a form agreeing not to criticize the military on social network websites like Twitter and Facebook. Reportedly, the form asks injured soldiers not to disclose any views on any military subject and not to say anything that would discourage those in the military. Wounded Warriors Canada is a nonprofit organization with the goal to help wounded soldiers. On its website, you can find soldiers thanking the organization for its help. But Scott Maxwell, the program's executive director, just recently learned of the policy. Maxwell has not seen the document, but is now seeking clarification from the defense minister. His organization is not funded by the military and says there is a need for such an organization. The military's Joint Personnel Support Union confirms the form exists, but says the purpose is to educate our members and personnel on what constitutes the appropriate and inappropriate use of social media and the possible ramifications. The policy has already received criticism, with some saying the policy is further evidence of mistreatment of those injured in the line of duty. Ashante Hathaway, Press TV, Montreal. <laughs> Jeez, that was crazy. So that's just a small sampling of the year that's been Canadian politics. You can take a look on our YouTube channel, and we really got to thank you. 61,000 views right now. We've only done about 200 videos, so we really got to thank for all the likes and shares and everyone, you know, spreading the love and making sure things are happening. That's right. So you guys have a great 2014. We're going to be there for you for 2014. Let's keep the pressure on the powers that shouldn't be and make some changes that have to occur. You know it. I'm Darren Howard. And I'm Robert Nisman. Make sure you are the change that you want to see in the world. And remember, one person standing up for what's right is still one person standing up for what's right. That's right. We'll see you guys real soon. Hello, my name is Nuella Warkworth, President, Chair, CEO and COO of People for Corporate Tax Cuts Canada. How can you raise the $500 you need to pay your share of Mr. Harper's $6 billion corporate tax cut? Well, here are some ideas from a few of the wonderful members of People for Corporate Tax Cuts Canada. There's 77-year-old Muriel Flagel, who sold her walker to raise her $500. What a woman! And Jimmy, who sold his hockey gear so his family could pay their share. But he's still playing. And others, who have nothing to sell, have chosen to give up public services so the government can save money and then give it up to the corporations. Rahid gave up using our health care system and is doing it himself. Such a brave man. And Mandy took her kids out of school. Oh, you go, girl! I hope this inspires you to think about how you'll raise the $500 you need to pay your share of Mr. Harper's $6 billion corporate tax cut. Please help others by sharing your ideas on our Facebook page. It'll show you care about corporations. From the makers of Canada's wildly popular internet surveillance bill, the new Government of Canada iPhone app tracks your online movements, studying your online purchases, Read your emails so you don't have to. Stores this information for future reference in an online registry. Well, not registry. We hate those. Online database. That sounds benign. The new Government of Canada iPhone app. Available now. Download it today or with the child predators. <laughs>